Once again, everybody, it is so good to see everybody. Isn't it good to be in church, everybody? Come on. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing unsolicited uh, every service. Pastor, it's so good to be back. It's been a long time since we've been back, and it's so good to be back. If this is your first time here at Cornerstone Church, we want to welcome you. If you're first time watching online, can we do one more time? Can we welcome everyone that's here for the first time or coming back? All right. Well, uh, just a couple of real quick things you saw about the small groups. Sign up for those. We have Grow Track today at right after this at 1 o'clock. And we are in the middle of a series on suffering, actually on First Peter, which talks about how to deal, how to live in a society when you're going through suffering and, and what the church is supposed to do. First Peter was written about 50 A.D. It's about 30 years after Jesus rose again from the dead. And Peter was one of the apostles. He's writing to a church and what he's doing is he's telling us how to live. And you can catch up with the series at cornerstonecheshire.com. You can catch up with the series online. And we're also on Spotify, and we're also on iTunes. You can catch up there. It's Cornerstone Cheshire. If you guys could just kill that light there, that'd be helpful. Thank you. There's one light that's spinning, and it's distracting me. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we are on a series about First Peter, and today we're going to be talking about suffering. How many of you like to suffer? I mean, it's just you love it, right? No, no one likes to suffer. But the truth of the matter is we all suffer. We all go through suffering. No matter how hard you try, you cannot stop suffering. In fact, I wish I would have taken, taken a class about how to suffer. I don't think any of us ever took a class how to suffer. Nor did we ever take a class how to balance a checkbook, did we? All the important things of life, how to raise children, all the things that really matter in life we don't get trained in. But the truth of the matter is you and I are going to suffer whether we like it or not. And how do we deal with suffering? Sometimes people try to run from it. How are we supposed to live our lives in a way that helps us to become what God's called us to become? Because when suffering comes, it's not a matter of if, but when. Isn't that encouraging? What did you learn today in church? Oh, I learned that suffering is going to come. It's not a matter of if, it's when. That's great. So I have good news for you that God wants to help us to learn how to suffer. Because suffering is a part of life, this side of heaven. Until God makes everything perfect and great one day when he consummates all of history, we're going to be going through suffering. How do you and I deal with it is very, very important. So we're going to look at it today because Peter talks about it, all right? So that's what we're going to do. You know, think about what happened just a couple of days ago on the towers of South, at Surfied, Florida. Uh, this condominium complex, you can see that, two-thirds of it collapsed. And at least five or six people lost their lives. There's over 155 people, or 53 people, unaccounted for. We don't know where they are at. And people are suffering right now. And uh, I think we should take a moment to pray. We did it in the last two services. I want to pray for those that lost loved ones and, and for the workers. Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we're praying for these people in Florida. Lord, we're praying for those that are trapped in the rubble. We're asking the rescue workers would get them out in Jesus' name. Lord, we're praying for a saving of lives. Father, we're also praying for those that have lost loved ones and those that don't know where their loved ones are right now and the terror that they're going through. Lord, we're asking in the midst of this horrific set of circumstances that some way, some way that you'd be able to administer your grace and your healing. Lord, you didn't cause this to take place. But, Father, out of this horrible set of circumstances, we're asking that something would come to bring healing and restoration to these families and loved ones in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so you have something like this take place with suffering. You know, it's interesting. You can see it's right on the beach. And Jesus talks about that, how we build our lives. And sometimes we build our lives and we think everything is fine. We think our lives are secure. We think we're all set. And then all of a sudden, the bottom falls out. All of a sudden, there's a pandemic. All of a sudden, you lose your job. All of a sudden, the doctor says, oh, we found something. You have cancer. Or maybe someone serves you divorce papers, or your kids tell you, I don't love you, or your parents abandon you. What are you to do when you go through this kind of suffering? What does the Bible say about suffering? And how are we supposed to get through suffering? One of the things I can tell you is this. Avoiding suffering at all costs guarantees more suffering. So many people do the best they can to avoid suffering. Now, I'm not suggesting we run around looking for suffering. But if, I tell you one thing. If you try to avoid suffering at all costs, you will delay. You will do, what you would do is you will have more suffering in the future. 
A lot of people keep themselves so busy, they don't want to deal with their issues. So they constantly are on their phones or constantly keeping themselves entertained, constantly in church perhaps, always busy, never want that alone time, lest they hear the whispers of, of, of suffering that will call them. And so they keep themselves so busy, they keep pushing it away. I don't want to deal with suffering. I don't want to deal with suffering. And sometimes even the church has been bad about this. Well, we tell people, give your life to Jesus and you'll get everything. You'll get a new car, a new house, a new dog. You, you give your life to Jesus and everything is going to be better. Everything's going to be happier and you're going to experience great joy. Everything's going to be better. You're going to feel good. You're going to have a life worth living. We tell people that. And ultimately, it is true in heaven. But we almost sell this thing that if you serve Jesus, it's going to go well with you now and you're going to be happy right now and you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. I used to believe that. In fact, God used to be an errand boy for me. He was like a genie to me. If God produced for me, then he existed. If he did not produce for me, he did not exist. And so if, if things were going well in my life, God exists. And when things did not go well in my life, wait a minute, God, where are you? I don't believe you anymore, God. And I went through a period for about a year where I became an agnostic. You know, an agnostic is someone that believes there is a God, but they don't know who or what or it is. And, and I found out through suffering I had a, never in my life, but I actually suffered for a period for at least a year. I suffered, and in that suffering I went through, I found out who God was. All the nonsense, all the fat that I had in my lives, the wrong idea of God got cut away through suffering. And I don't pretend to be an expert on it, but I do know this. It was a great teacher. And suffering has a way of getting your attention like nothing else. In John 16, Jesus tells us something quite extraordinary. He says this, I have said these things to you, that in me, notice, in me, you may have peace. How many of you want to have peace? Absolutely, right? You may have peace. In the world, you will have peace. Tribulation. Tribulation is like an earthquake shaking. It means trouble. In this earth, you will have trouble. A lot of people need to understand that. Even if you give your life to Christ, you are going to have trouble. Trouble is going to follow you. I'm sorry to tell you. Oh, this is great. I, I'm so glad I came to church today. I'm hearing that I'm going to suffer. I don't want to hear that. That's why I came to church. Well, I have news for you. God will prevail through suffering. God wants to bless you. He wants you to experience his presence. You see, in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome. And because he overcame, we can overcome. And we have a hope beyond this planet. My friends, it's one of the most important things you can understand is to understand who you are in Christ if you're giving your life to Christ. And I always say, and I'll say it again, the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. Why? Because he knew what was ahead. My friends, you need to look beyond this place called earth. You need to look into heaven and who you are and whose you are in Christ. And if you don't have that, you truly are hopeless. And it's my prayer, it's our prayer that you would come to know Jesus Christ, who's the answer to all these areas of our lives. So this is the truth. You're going to have trouble. So we might as well learn how to deal with trouble, right? I remember being, uh, going overseas on a mission trip. I was in India, and it was like hot. I mean, it was like hot, hot. It was like 85, 90 degrees. These, these, people were, these, uh, these folks were wearing wool caps, and I'm sweating, 103 degrees. And I just learned, you know what? There's no air conditioning. I'm, just, I'm going to be hot. I'm going to be uncomfortable. And this is the way it's going to be. And so I just learned to deal with it. I came to the conclusion that I was going to be hot. And so in many ways, you have to come to the conclusion that you're going to have to suffer in this planet. Don't be surprised by it. Don't be discouraged by it. Know how to move through it. Okay? And so I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So avoiding suffering at all costs guarantees more suffering. And suffering is a part of life. So why not learn how to deal with it in a way that's productive and instructive? And 1 Peter 4, 1 through 9 says this. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking... 
For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, what is that supposed to mean? So if I suffer, I don't have to sin anymore? We're going to get into it in a little bit. But this is kind of where we're going. This is the launching point from today. But let's continue to look at what suffering is and what it's not. There's about 13, there's more than 13, but I just put 13 to help us to understand. There's about 13 to 14 primary ways you and I suffer. One of the ways we suffer is from um, Adamic suffering. And so basically, if I said it correctly, it is because Adam sinned. Adamic. Adam sinned. Our first parents sinned. They chose to go their own way. They chose to be their own gods, and basically. And they said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to obey God. I'm going to do what I want to do. And this is what happened. As a result of our parents' first decision, all the earth has been cursed, and everything is not the way it's supposed to be. And as a result, suffering has come as a result. Another type of suffering can be demonic suffering. I know a lot of people like to blame demons for everything, but do you not think the last 16 months there's been some demonic activity within our culture? The kind of hysteria and hostility, yeah. And so sometimes the the, the demons are behind the scenes. I'm not saying they're controlling people extremely, but they are involved what's going on. We don't have time today to talk all about that, but there is demonic suffering. There's also victim suffering where it wasn't even your fault. Maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe someone walked out on you. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you were in a car accident. It wasn't your fault. And as a result of that now, you are suffering, and you are a victim of it. And it's not fun to go through that. And that's not fair, and as it happens. Maybe you were a collective suffering of a bunch of things that took place through a period of time. It came to the point where finally there was a collapse in your relationships. Or maybe you were disciplinary suffering. And by the way, this is a good suffering. You don't see it as a child. The Bible says God disciplines those he loves. If you're not disciplined, you're illegitimate as a child. So sometimes you have to suffer through discipline to make you better. And that can happen. At the moment, you don't see it. My parents used to force me to play trombone lessons. I hated them. But thank God they did because it helped me to develop my musical gift. And later on, it became, I played around the country playing trombone. I learned how to play guitar and sing and all that. And it wasn't for them forcing me to take those trombone lessons, which I hated. I wouldn't have developed these other skills that actually paid me thousands and thousands of dollars to help me get through school. So it's really cool how God works through discipline. And he does it through our parents, and God does it as well. But you don't see it at the moment. You don't see it at the moment. Another thing is a persecution suffering. We can see this all through the book of 1 Peter. We're talking about persecution. When you're doing things God's way, and as a result of doing things God's way, you are suffering persecution. My friends, it's happening right now like never before. It's happening in North Korea. Christians are being killed for their faith. It's happening in pockets of India. It's happening in, in China, actually, as well. In other parts of the country, people are suffering because they choose to serve God. And we're seeing a little bit of that now as well because the world is going a different way than what God's way is. And we're becoming strange, and we're, we'll get into that in a few moments. We're, seeing, we're different, and as a result of being different, we're being persecuted to a certain extent. But right now, I'd say in our country, it's at a low level compared to other parts in the world. So there's also testimonial sufferings, and this is where you go through something that's horrible, but as a result of that, you help somebody else out later on. There's also another thing, providential suffering. This is the Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember Joseph, and if you know the story, but he was sold into slavery, and as a result of going to slavery and learning Egyptian language, he raised up in the ranks, he saved an entire nation and his own people. So God can use providential suffering to bring about healing and restoration for other people. So this preventative suffering, there's all sorts of sufferings. This is my favorite one, mysterious sufferings. Like, I don't know why I'm suffering, but I'm suffering. And sometimes you just don't know the answer. Can we just tell you some advice that I learned from the book of Job? Job's friends got it right for the first couple of weeks. When someone's suffering really bad, sometimes the best thing you can do is quote them a scripture verse and tell them to listen to Caleb. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Sometimes the best thing to do when someone's suffering is just be there. Just be there. And say, I don't know what you're going through, but I want to let you know I'm here for you. Sometimes the greatest thing you can say is nothing. Sometimes there's no words. And I'm going to encourage you, if you ever see someone going through a tremendous amount of suffering, the best thing to do is not give them advice. They don't want to hear it. Just be there for them. 
Just be there for them. It's so important that we do that when we don't know what's going on. Then there was punishment suffering. This is obvious. You've done something wrong, and as a result of that, you're suffering the consequences of something. Okay? And so that's quite obvious. That's a, that type of suffering. There's consequential suffering as well. Uh, things that you've done that are even good or bad can happen. And finally, uh, apocalyptic suffering. Those are when the zombies come. Okay? And we explain what that is. That means the end of the age. When the end of the age come, and I don't know if we're there yet, but when there's the cataclysmic things begin to happen on the planet, we are going to suffer as a result of that. Now, whatever your eschatology is, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, we're going to experience some degree of suffering. So, things about suffering. Ready? Here's the first one. You will suffer. And that, look at your neighbor and say, not me. Okay. You will suffer. And number two, suffering is complex and multi-layering. It's, it's not that easy to always figure out why things are happening. Okay? So sometimes the best thing you do, as I mentioned earlier, is say, God, I don't understand what's going on. Okay? I don't understand what's going on. But what I do encourage you to do is to ask God and, and say, God, what is going on in my life? Why am I going through this? And here's another one. You are not always a victim. We like, to, we like to be victims because if I'm a victim, it's not my fault. And being a victim gives me a license to do what I want to do. Since I had a rotten day at the office, I can go home and be mean to my family. Or since this happened to me, I'm going to make your life a living hell because you know what? I don't like that I was treated. And so we can take these circumstances and we can become a victim and we can even march in parades. And, and listen, I'm all for that. I'm all for standing for justice and all that. But I've never seen a parade when someone said, can you, have you ever seen a parade with people holding signs saying, I was mean to my spouse. I stole the other day. No one, you, no one goes to the streets uh, uh, protesting the, their behavior, right? We always protest that something has happened to us. But the truth of the matter is, all of us are guilty of all sorts of things that cause suffering. So we have to understand that. You are not always a victim. And finally, when we suffer, we like to be seen as a victim. I like it. I do. Oh, it's not fair what happened to me. I'm going through this. Oh, uh, and, and that doesn't really help. That doesn't really help in that process. Okay? The most helpful and harmful people have been, have been, excuse me, the most helpful and harmful people have been through suffering. Make no mistake about it. Hurt people, hurt people. Healed people, heal people, right? I mean, Mother Teresa, at the age of eight, lost her father. She went through a significant amount of suffering, but she chose a different path and became one of the most wonderful human beings in the last century. Another gentleman, not really a gentleman, a mass murderer who I'm not going to quote, lost his father at eight years old, had a rough upbringing and chose a different path. You see, what do you do with your suffering? You're either harmful or you are helpful. Learning how to win the battles when suffering. How do we do that? Well, here we go. We're going to read the scriptures, and we're going to go through it. All right. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to, the, to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though through judgment in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way of God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hostility to one another, without grumbling. 
Okay, now, what are we supposed to do? I just read the whole thing there. And we're going to go through it now, verse by verse, a little bit. Okay, learning how to win the battles when suffering. I like what Oswald Chambers said. Great author, wrote the tremendous devotional called Utmost for His Highest. This is what he says about suffering. I think it's very apropos and very true. We all know people who have been made much meaner and more irritable and more intolerable to live with by suffering, right? Absolutely. It is not right to say that all suffering perfects. It only perfects one type of person, the one who accepts the call of God in Christ Jesus. My friend, God can take your darkest night and your most horrific set of circumstances, and he can redeem it in a way that nothing else can. I've seen it happen in many people's lives. They've gone through extraordinary suffering, and they gave it to God, and God turned it around. God didn't cause it to take place. But there's a promise in Scripture in Romans 8, all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So if we'll surrender the pain to God, God can take your suffering and turn it into something that is actually beneficial, even though it wasn't God's original plan. So how do we win the battles when suffering? The first one is this. The battle begins always in the mind. Every battle you and I ever face always starts right here. This is the front gates of everything. How you think. How you think controls your life. What entertains you, trains you, right? What you think towards, you will drive towards. So it's very important how we manage our thought life and what we think. If we believe a lie, the Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Conversely, if you believe a lie, a lie will imprison you. So we have to, the battle begins right here. What are you and I thinking about? And so the word of God is very, very, straight, very true about this. Is this, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. That means get ammunition. Arm yourselves with what? With the same way of thinking as Jesus. So we need to get the mind of Christ to fight. We need to get the mind of Jesus Christ. So how do we do that? For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We'll get to that in a few moments. Well, how do we get the mind of Christ? How do we do that? Well, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, it says this. For the weapons, notice a military term again. For our weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are strongholds? Thinking, right? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Again, this is a very violent work. We take every thought captive. I am not going to allow those thoughts to seep into me because this is what happens. If you believe a lie in your mind, your, your conscious mind, once it goes from your conscious mind, it goes to your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is like a computer program. It just runs, and it has consequences without you even realizing it. This is what begins to happen. So what we want to do is manage the input we're getting in here, making sure we're not putting wrong thinking in there. And that is a huge part of Suffering. So learning how to win the battle. The battle begins in the mind, and Jesus suffered, and so will we. Isn't that good news? I'm hearing applause and amens all around this place. This is a really wonderful sermon, Pastor. I love to hear I got to suffer. All three, okay. Hey, guys, I don't want to suffer. Are you kidding me? I don't think anyone wants to suffer. But you know what? When we do it God's way, it's a part of life. It's part of what happens inside of heaven. And God can turn it for something good. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. So Christ suffered. Look what the word of God says. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. This is Jesus. Did Jesus ever sin? Absolutely not. Then why did he suffer? Why did he have to learn obedience? How can Jesus have to learn obedience if he was perfect? Because he still learned obedience through suffering. And so if Jesus learned, we're going to learn as well. In fact, in 2 Timothy, it says this. Indeed, we read this earlier in a couple sermons ago. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone will be persecuted if you want to live in Christ. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. This is Jesus talking here. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So listen, everybody. We're going to follow Jesus. Persecution is going to come. We see it happening a little bit. In other parts of the world, it's horrific what's happening. When you choose to follow God, persecution will come, but you can overcome it. 
You can have Christ in the, in the suffering, and you can see beyond the suffering, but you still, you and I can suffer. So, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What is that supposed to mean? I don't have a lot of time to break it down, but it's this. When you are in pain, it kind of gets rid of everything else. It doesn't matter, right? Think about it. When you're in pain, I remember being having a stomach virus one time, and I was so sick, and my family come, hey, it was time for dinner. Don't talk, I love food, but don't talk to me about food when you're nauseous and you're, and you're, and you're hugging a porcelain throne, and you're talking to it like it's your friend. <laughs> Help me. I mean, I, I'm a baby. When I, get, when I get sick like that, I ask for Jesus to take me home. So my wife said, you're such a baby. Anyhow, but I remember having a stomach virus. I don't want to talk about the, that the fact that the Yankees lost to the Red Sox last night because Aaron Judge did not hit a home run. I don't care about that when I'm sick, but I do care about it right now. So anyhow, so what happens is it, it, you don't really, what happens is the things that normally would trouble you or trip you up, it gets rid of those things. Those things don't matter. No one at the end of their life goes, gee, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. No, they don't care about the latest movie or the latest, sport, latest sports team. They care about the essentials of life, their relationship with God and other people. And that's what happens. It helps you to get rid of sin in some regards. Okay? I don't have time to unpack it more than that for this point. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So when we suffer, we have two ways we can suffer. We can suffer in the flesh or in the Holy Spirit. Here we do it. In the flesh, I will sin. In the spirit, I will serve. So what will happen is I will, if, I, if I get wronged against, if I'm suffering, I'm going to sin. I, because I'm going through a rotten time, I'm going to make your life a rotten time. Or I can use suffering to serve, to serve the purposes of God. God, I don't understand what's going on, but somehow you're gonna redeem what I'm going through right now. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Let me explain what that means. Gentiles were non-believing people back in those days. The early church was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish and he still is Jewish. And so Gentiles were considered the un unredeemed, unredeemed, the heathens. So the Bible is basically saying this, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living and sensuality. It means whatever I want to do, I do. If it feels good, I do it. Or like the book of Judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's living sensuality. Passions, drunkenness, orgies. I'm not going to talk about that one. Drinking parties. And lawless idolatry, okay? L lawless idolatry. I'm just doing all sorts of things. I'm worshiping various things. I'm worshiping my job. I'm worshiping um, material possessions, and I don't care. Whatever I have to do to get this position, whatever I have to do to get this product, whatever I have to do to get this position at work, I'm going to do. I don't care if I have to lie. I don't care if I have to cheat. I don't care if I have to cheat because I'm a stay-at-home right now. It's online learning after all. Everyone's doing it, and I need to get into college, so I'm going to cheat on this exam. Everyone else is doing it. No one has to know. That kind of suffering. Well, I don't, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Lawless idolatry. What happens if you say, I'm not going to do that? What's wrong with you, right? So as we move on, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them. Like, what's wrong with you? What are you, crazy? Why aren't you doing that? Why? Because every person inside instinctively knows that there's a God, whether they realize it or not. And when you choose not to do something that they're doing, they feel like you're condemning them. Now, sometimes we do do that. But the fact that you're doing the right thing is a testimony that they're doing the wrong thing. Why is there such a, a kickback? Think about it. Look at the kickback that begins to happen. So, surprise when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you, right? Uh, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead. That, the, that th the, excuse me, through judged, though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. I mean, got a big, I have a big glare. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading the screen today. 
The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So the end of all things at hand. What that simply means is Peter believed at any moment Christ was going to return. We believe the same thing today. We don't know when the time is. But guess what? Your life is short on this earth. You don't, even if you live 85 to 90 years old, it's still a short period of time. Your end is, is coming. Why waste time? You're only a teenager once. You're only in your 20s once. You're only a middle age once, right? You're only a senior once. So at the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded and be in prayer, asking God to help you to discern the suffering that you're going through. Above all, keep loving. Listen to this one. Above all, keep loving another earnestly. You see how this works, everybody? That in your suffering, if you're in a community of other believers, it helps you get through it. This is what's so important of not going through life by yourself. You are called to be part of the body. So above all, keeping loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So as we conclude here today, avoiding suffering at all costs guarantees more suffering. So don't try to run from it. Run through it with Jesus Christ. And finally, suffering is a part of life. And you can suffer in the flesh, which will lead you to sin. Or you can suffer in the spirit, which leads you to serve. I just want to conclude with this one scripture where the Apostle Paul says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. So the Apostle Paul is saying, even though life gets difficult, even though I'm going through a hard time, even though I'm being crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair because I have a hope. Do you have that hope? That no matter what takes place, the best is still yet to come. Do you have that hope through Christ Jesus? It's the thing that keeps you afloat in the sea of suffering. It's like a life vest. The ship may have gone down, and everyone may be sinking around you, but I have that life vest of the hope. I know who I am in Christ, and I'm going to see a better day. I'm going to see a better day. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also manifest in our body. And so I pray that the suffering, what that will do is chisel away the things that are bad, the things that are holding us back, that we can experience the life of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I recognize that no one likes to suffer. I don't like to suffer. But Father, I want to thank you so much for sending you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. You paid a debt we could never pay. And you rose again from the dead. And that when we give our lives to you, no matter how bad it gets, it's never going to get any worse. It's only going to get better in you. We thank you that in you the best days are always ahead. And Father, I pray for strength right now for those that are going through suffering. Those that are going through difficult times. We ask for your grace and we ask for your mercy to be upon them. With every head bowed, let me ask you a question today. If you were to die today, do you absolutely know for sure you would go to heaven. If you say, well, yeah, I'm a pretty good person, there's only one way in which you can be saved. It's through faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you'd like to give your life to Christ today, maybe you've walked away and you want to get right, but today is a day of prayer. Let's, Let's go ahead and pray quietly to the Lord in our hearts. Lord Jesus, that's right, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that you're the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross and raising up from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose this day. I choose this day to serve you. I choose not to be the boss of my life. Lord, you are God and I'm not. I give my life to you today. Come fill me now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, we believe you became born again. Jesus says, come, follow me. And so in the pocket in front of you, there are cards. You can pull them out. 
It says, my decision today, I'm committing my life to Christ or I'm renewing my commitment. Also, there's a phone number behind me as well. If you want to text this number, you can put it up there. Uh, you can get your phone out and text 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And write Believe. We'll help you with the next steps. Okay, everybody? Hey, listen, before we leave here today, I also want to give you an opportunity to give. You don't have to give, you get to give. And there are four different ways you can give. You can see the numbers up there. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire. Get the numbers right up there. You can use our Push Pay app. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. Or as you walk out of here today, there are boxes, if you're here in person, most of you are, there are boxes in the back. You can place your offerings there. And all this is used to help continue the ministry of Cornerstone Church, both here and around the world through our missionaries. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to make a difference today. Lord, we thank you. You promised that you would meet all of our needs. And Father, I pray that you would just encourage everyone today. Father, I pray you would bless everyone today in Jesus' name, with your presence, with your provision, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you guys. We have growth track in about five minutes from now. Let me just say a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the loving Heavenly Father give you grace, stability, love, and power. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much.